She's had a lot of big jobs in Dalton McGuinty's government, education, transportation, municipal affairs and housing, and Aboriginal affairs. But of course, the job she now wants is Premier, and the numbers suggest she's one of the favourites to get it. Let's find out more about Kathleen Wynne, the MPP for Don Valley West, whom we welcome back to TVO. Nice to see you again. Pleasure to be here. I'm asking the six of you the same first question off the top, so here we go. What particular skill set do you offer that would make you the best choice of the six to be Premier of Ontario at this particular moment in our history? At this particular moment, we need a Premier who's going to be able to reach out to people who have different views of uh, how, to, how to move forward, who have differing opinions, be able to bring them together and find common ground. And it, it is what I've done in my career. I mean, I'm, I'm a trained mediator, so in the decade before I came into office, that's the work that I did. But more than that, working in community, working as a minister, I've, I've brought people together and, and been able to find common ground. I think that's what we need right now. That's the skill I have. How did the portfolios that you've had prepare you to be Premier? They, uh, the portfolios allowed me to learn about Ontario. You know, I, I made it my I made it my business to travel around the province to understand the regions of the province, whether we were talking about small schools. I mean, I, I, I always talk about the, the school of six students in Sunaros outside of Kenora. You know, six kids. And then in downtown Toronto, elementary school in my riding that has 2,000 kids in it. So those, uh, the, the continuum of, uh, of difference across the province is huge. So it's allowed me the opportunity to do that. Um, and and I've learned, I've learned about the interconnectedness of portfolios and of the endeavors in the province. So when I was Minister of Transportation, I was learning about infrastructure. But learning about infrastructure is to learn about the economic pulse of the province because if you don't have good infrastructure, you don't have a, a strong economy. So it's, it's allowed me to learn those lessons of how everything is connected. Let me pick up on that economic piece of the puzzle because strictly speaking, you haven't had one of those so-called finance or economic development, one of those economic portfolios. Although I would argue the transportation actually is an economic portfolio. Okay, uh, argue away because the, <laughs> I mean, the, the critics will say job one is fixing the economy and here's a woman yep. who hasn't had, strictly speaking, an economic portfolio. To which you say what? To which I say that uh, my experience across government has allowed me to see what makes a strong economy, you know, and really understand that uh, the conditions that we have to put in place as a province for business to thrive has everything to do with great education, great health care, great infrastructure. It also has to do with having the right tax regime, making sure that small business gets access to capital, and those are things that are in my economic plan as well. But honestly, Steve, my economic plan is my plan for the province. You know, it's, it's about social justice and fiscal responsibility going hand in hand, being one in the same thing. You mentioned taxes. Let me pick up on that. Can we balance a $14.4 billion deficit without a tax increase? What, I'm, what I have said is that uh, we are going to need revenue streams. So if I go back to infrastructure for a moment, we're not going to be able to uh, balance the budget and provide the amount of new infrastructure, transit in particular, if we talk about the, the GTHA, but roads and bridges in northern Ontario and small municipalities, we're not going to be able to do those things without revenue streams. So uh, I am going to be very clear with the people of Ontario about how we're going to have to pay for that infrastructure that we need. So uh, that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of policy that I will put in place. Okay, so be clear here. What does that mean? Tolls? It means, it means that there will have to be uh, a, a choice among a number of, of tools. And, you know, road tolls is one. Uh, parking levies is another. Uh, payroll taxes are another. So there's a whole range of tools. And uh, the Toronto Board of Trade and Civic Action in, in Toronto are talking about the GTHA and the kinds of uh, tools that we need here. But I think we need to make sure that we have a, a revenue stream across the province. And the federal government is going to need to work with us on that. They have worked with us. We have had some success in partnering with the federal government. But we need dedicated revenue streams for infrastructure, including transit. The only thing I've heard you say about payroll taxes is that they need to be cut. You would be giving a, a bigger break to those uh, small businesses who are paying the employee health tax right now. Well, I'm saying we need to modernize, you know. You need to, we need to make sure that rules that were put in place 20 or 30 years ago uh, are not outdated. And in, I think in the case of the employee uh, health tax exemption, 
$400,000 for a business, I think, is, is outdated. I think we need to look probably at $800,000. That brings you less revenue in, though. Well, I understand that, but it, it initially it may, but the fact is that if that business can grow, then we get more revenue. And if, if what we're doing is holding the business back from growing, then that's a problem. But income taxes, harmonized sales tax increase, you think those are? No plans to change those. You know, uh, the, the reality is that we're going to have to work together. I mean, you, you've had Glenn Murray on the show, and he's now, he's now working with me. And we're looking at his economic ideas in terms of restructuring within the tax system. And if there are good ideas there, I'll draw on those. Let me ask you about your favorite subject, which is education. You were a, a pretty successful education minister for three years when you had the portfolio. But I'm wondering if you can kind of peel the curtain back a bit and give us some insight into some of the presumably private conversations you had with either the Premier or your Cabinet colleagues or caucus colleagues, when they put Bill 115 on the table and said, here's what we need to do in order to achieve these savings and get these contracts, I's dotted, T's crossed, I'm wondering if the woman who had such good relationships with the teacher unions at any point said, are you guys out of your mind? You're going to screw up my legacy on this file. Did you say that? <laughs> Just like that? In those words, exactly. <laughs> no. no. Uh, but I've been pretty clear and I've been pretty public about the reality that, you know, there, there's a range of opinion about, uh, about many subjects in, uh, in caucus and cabinet, and there was a range of opinions about this strategy as well. Uh, the Premier's been clear that the, po the process as it evolved was not what it should have been, and I certainly agree with that. Never in my wildest dreams, Steve, did I think we were going to have to impose contracts. I knew that we had said in the budget last year that we would put legislation in place if necessary because we had to constrain those compensation packages. But it was always my belief and my expectation that because our relationships were as good as they were with our education partners, that we would be able to reach negotiated settlements. So why didn't it happen in your view? Well, in my view, it went wrong early on and got positional very early. It was a combination of the process not being as clear as it should have been. And, you know, the reality is that Gerard had started a process when he was Minister of Education. Kennedy. Gerard Kennedy had started a process. I refined that process. You know, it, it, it became somewhat more formal, but nothing was written down. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a formal statutory process. And then when we came to this round, of negotiations, there really was a lack of clarity about what was the role of the school boards, what was the, the role of local bargaining in this process. So the process was not clear. There were no extra resources on the table. We were looking for um, constraint, obviously. And I honestly believe that there were the wrong people at the table. Okay. I think there was a not a good engagement. The wrong people on which side? I can only speak from the government side. You know, I think that there probably should have been uh, some other people at the table. But again, I didn't get to choose those people. That was, uh, that, was another, uh, that was another process. But I can't speak for the other side of the table. Uh, I get that you established good relationships with the people on the other side of the table while you were the minister. But if you win the leadership and become premier and try to reach out to the other side to get this thing done, I mean, you've said it yourself. You said the reality is we have no more money. Right. So we're right. still looking at zero right. and zero, and they're still looking at a year of being disrespected in their view. How does any of that change that? Well, so here's the thing. I, I believe we have two groups of people who want to get along. I mean, remember, this impasse at the moment, this, this conflict at the moment, is not born of a long-term, deep-seated, hostile relationship. We have had a very good relationship. And so it's, it's very different than the government before us, if I may say, where there was, you know, there were two terms of really bad blood between uh, the, the conservative government and the education sector. That hasn't been the case. So we want to get along and we know how to get along. The other piece of that is that, you know, teachers want to deliver extracurriculars. They want to be engaged with their schools and they want schools to do well. So we're natural allies. There has been a very bad process and, and I am absolutely willing to say that and open to it. But we don't have any choice about trying to repair the relationship. We have to repair it. In the interests of students, we have to repair it. That's what we have to put at the center of the conversation. Well, there is a choice. They can say, well, you know well, what, you guys messed with us and now we're going to get rid of you and put somebody else well, in. Well, I, I don't think that, that's not a long-term strategy that's going to work. It's a strategy you know? they've pursued for 25 years, frankly. Well, <laughs> well, you know, from my perspective, there have been ups and downs in that 
strategy, you know? And, and there have been long periods of getting along with the government and working with the government, and we've had one of those long periods, and that's when the improvements get made. That's when we move ahead in education. And so when I say there's no choice, there is no choice. If we're going to continue to improve the education system, there's no choice about the government getting along with the education sector. It has to happen. And I've said to, I've said to uh, teachers, I'll stay in the room until we figure out how we're going to re-engage. That's how committed I am to this. Let me ask you one more policy question, and then we'll move on and talk some politics. And this uh, refers to your time as Aboriginal Affairs Minister. We are seeing across the country right now. Sorry, you were going to you say something. You know what? Yeah, sorry. Can I just? Yeah. I just need to say. I just need to be clear that I do not intend to rip up the contracts. And I just. I'm sorry to interrupt, mm -hmm. but I just need to be clear about that because there is no more money. What we have to talk about is how we go forward and how we put a better process in place. Okay. Okay. Uh, your time in Aboriginal affairs. This issue is hot all over the country Absolutely. right now. I don't have to tell you. I don't know more in the meeting with the prime minister and so on and so forth. Do you think you made any progress on this file, and if so, what? Well, our government, and you know, I in the last year of uh, of, of the government as the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, um, you know, we we have continued to improve our working relationship with uh, with Aboriginal people, whether it's the Métis Nation of Ontario or whether it's Union of Ontario Indians, where we actually are in a bilateral conversation about how to create a new education model and how the province can support the communities in in uh, a better education model. I was on the verge of bringing some recommendations about uh, how to how to in a general way uh, work with the First Nations on reserve education and lend some of the resources of the provincial government to that process so I think I think that we have made a lot of progress uh, it's very unfortunate to me that the expectations of a better working relationship were raised by the federal government. I think with the apology and with the meeting that, uh, that Stephen Harper set up, I think there was a heightened expectation that something was going to move, you know, and it hasn't. And so the, the degree of disappointment is much greater because those expectations have been raised. Our responsibility as a provincial government is to continue on the path that we've been on and to, in in light of what's going on with Idle No More, be even more vigilant. So if we talk about Ring of Fire and the chromite deposit in, the, in Northern Ontario, we have to be very clear that our relationship with the First Nations who are in that community, with the Aboriginal uh, people, are paramount. We've got to have a good working relationship. It's got to be a situation where the people who live close to that mineral deposit are going to benefit from that uh, economic development. Okay, let's talk some politics in our remaining moments here. Okay. And this is the part of the interview where I say, here's what I'm hearing. Because <laughs> I'm out there, you know, I'm yeah. out there and I'm attending stuff and talking to people, and here's what I'm hearing. Kathleen Wynne is terrific, great integrity, knows her brief, she knows so much about so many different levers in the government, brings people together. However, has never been in opposition. We have a minority parliament right now, which is fractious. We may need somebody who's got an outward appearance of being more aggressive and tougher in the premier's chair in order to deal with the opposition, and that's Pupatello, it's not her. What's your response to that? So let me just tackle the first part, the opposition part, and then I'll come to the what's needed. Um, I think if you ask some of the members of Mike Harris's cabinet and government whether I know how to act in opposition, they would probably say, indeed, she does. I wasn't in the legislature, that's absolutely true. I was a public school trustee, I was a community activist, but my skills at uh, opposing and clarifying issues and making sure that people understand where I stand and where we differ are, are pretty finely tuned. Um, and, you know, I've demonstrated that I can win elections. So that's, that, from my perspective, that's not an issue for me. I believe that I can build a team and we can, uh, we can launch a very, a very strong uh, campaign. And, and we'll do that if necessary. But to the second part of your question, I'm not sure that that's what's needed right now. I think what's needed right now is someone who's going to be able to work with the opposition, someone who's going to be able to reach across the floor and say, look, we had an election a year and a bit ago, and we need to govern now. The people of Ontario have asked us as a minority government to work together and govern. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. But if we have to, if we have to go into an election, I'm ready to do that. Absolutely. You did a scrum a few hours ago after your speech at the Board of Trade where you were cockier than I've ever seen you before. <laughs> and I wonder if that is because Sandra Pupatello is sort of out there and her people are out there saying, 
I'm the one to win the election. She's the one to bring people together. But when we're into a campaign and at a leader's debate, when you've got to be in somebody's face, Pupatello is your person, not Kathleen Wynne. That's what's out there. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. It's just, it's just so interesting to me that that's, what, uh, that that's what's being said, given my history, given my history as a, as a feisty community activist. You know, that's, so this is not that's a new thing I, for you. That's how I got into provincial politics. Okay. Here's the other thing I'm hearing. Some people have said to me, if we vote for Sandra Pupatello as leader, we get Kathleen Wynne too, because she'll stick around and they'll be a good team. If we vote for Kathleen Wynne for leader, we don't necessarily get Pupatello because she probably won't come back from private life where she, she is right now and she won't come back into public life. Pupatello, we get two. Wynne, we only get one. Well, I, you know, I haven't, uh, I haven't heard Sandra say whether she is going to run or not. I guess I assumed that she would run for office, uh, no, she, she, whether she is the leader or not. She, I asked her about it, and she gave me a bit of a... Well, I'll tell you what she said. What she said was, I can't commit 100% to coming back because whoever wins, the new leader would have to sign my nomination papers, and I don't know if the new leader would, would want me back or welcome me back so I can't commit. Uh, I'll, I'll sign Sandra's nomination papers. You'll sign the papers. papers. Absolutely. Okay, so that Absolutely. excuse is off the table. Happy, happy to have her. You know, it would be great to have Sandra as part of my team. Absolutely. And I'm happy to sign her nomination papers and happy to find the rest of the people that she needs to sign the nomination papers. What about the other, though, that if she decides not to come back, you get both if you get her, you get one if you get you. Well, you know, people have to make that decision, Steve. The members of the party have to make that decision. They have to, to decide what is needed right now. And I've put myself forward as someone who's got experience. I've got the energy and the enthusiasm. And, you know, I understand, I understand how to win, and I understand how to collaborate and work together. So that's the skill set that I have, and I hope, that, I hope that will be seen by the party and that I'll have an opportunity to leave. Is she a riskier choice because she doesn't have a seat in the legislature and therefore... If she stays true to what she said, she doesn't want to bring the house back until she has a seat. So that wouldn't be the day after family day. That would be presumably later, maybe March. Who knows? Is that a problem for her? So I'm not going to pass judgment on Sandra or, or her situation. Pass judgment. I'm not, not? I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to say, and you can, you, can ex you can extrapolate from what I say, I think we need to get back to the legislature right away. Uh, I think the fact that I have a seat is an advantage. I think it's important to get back to the legislature. No one's comfortable with prorogation. You know, the reality is that uh, we've lost 18 days in the House. It's enough. We need to get back, and we need to get at it. So I think that February 19th is a date we need to go back. Have you or any of your people had any conversations, either officially or unofficially, I'm trying to cover every base here in asking this <laughs> question, with anyone on the NDP side of the equation on how your parties could work together if you win once the house is back no really no nothing to, to the to the best of, now there are a lot of people working on my campaign so i can't vouch for every single conversation that every single member of my team has had but i can tell you that i have had none of those conversations my senior team has had none of those conversations and you know i think that there have been signals sent in public certainly by me to both leaders of the opposition that I want to work with them. But beyond that, there haven't been any private conversations that I'm aware of. Because people are, I think, entitled to know whether or not you are considering a variety of options for working with one of the other two opposition parties, such as a possible coalition, such as a possible formally written out accord, such as a, I don't know, we'll go bill by bill and just see how we go. Where's your thinking on that? So, honestly, I haven't talked about coalition. That's something that has come at me from, uh, from the media. I haven't heard anybody else talking about coalition. But what I am clear about is that it is going to be up to me and to Tim Hudak and to Andrea Horvath to have a conversation about how we can or cannot work together. I'm willing to work with one or both of them. Um, but the, the nature of that conversation and what it will lead to has got to be He's got to be with all of us. It's not for me to say, this is what I want to do. You know, this is, this is how I see it. That's not the kind of leadership that I bring. It's not the kind of leader that I am. I, I want us to work collaboratively, and I want us to co-create whatever that, uh, that go-forward position is going to be. Understood. That's our time, and as I say to all Thank the you. candidates, good luck on the 26th of January at Maple Leaf Gardens. Thank you very much. Kathleen Wynn, MPP, Don Valley West. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.